You're listening to American Medicine Today, presented by the Bonatti Spine Institute, featuring the internationally acclaimed inventor of the Bonatti Spine Procedures, Alfred Bonatti, MD. Once again, here are Dr. Bonatti and your host, Kimberly Brumell. Thanks for joining us on American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Brumell, joined by our friend and executive radio producer, Ethan Euchre. Glad to be here. <laughs> and <laughs> We're on radio, nobody can see that. Junior Mint over here to my right-hand side. That's Jeff Wagstaff, our senior fellow. I think since I've invented all these titles, moving <laughs> forward, I'd like to be known as the captain. Captain? Mm. Aye, aye, captain. Oh, captain, my captain. I'm thinking. <laughs> uh, I kind of like the senior fellow. That works. Senior fellow works. It's yeah. a little more distinguished. It, it is. is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> well, if you find yourself not being able to do the things you love to do, say you love to do yard work and you love gardening. Um, and you're no longer able to do that because your back hurts. You're unable to lift the things that get you to do um, the sort of activities. There is hope. If you like to motorcycle and be out on the road and seeing America, but you're no longer okay. able to because you can't manipulate those things and you get can't your have your foot down, Head out the Bonatti out. Spine Institute can help. Mm-hmm. Um, if you're having a hard time getting out of bed in the morning, and not just because you party too hard the night before, but realistically, if it is painful to try and sit up, if it's painful to put on your socks and you're unable to basically take care of yourself and you find yourself sitting on a chair or you visited doctors and doctors are saying, nothing you can do, sorry, we don't know why you're in pain, but nope, just got to live with it for the rest of your life. Uh Uh-uh, not the case. Here's a prescription. Seek out the Bonatti Spine Mm -hmm. Institute because you don't have to live your life in pain. There is true patient resolve. They have a 98.75% patient reported success rate. And Dr. Bonatti has always led the path in least invasive. The Bonatti Spine Procedures are exclusive and patented. Nobody else in the world can do his procedures except here in Hudson, Florida. And what is great as is they're targeted for each individual patient. And the doctors are so astute that they can basically tell you what your pain is without you having to say a word. And you go in um, to the procedure and you're interactive with them and they have pinpoint accuracy where they're able to relieve your pain. With that said, we have an exciting show. Um, And up first. In today's Back to Life segment, we will talk to a patient of the Bonatti Spine Institute who went from living a life that was restricted by pain and discomfort through their journey of finding the Bonatti Spine Institute and are now living pain free. My pleasure to introduce to you from Pineville, Louisiana, Crystal Morris. Thank you for being here. Hi. Hi. (laughs) How Uh, are you? We Being are good, well. good, wonderful. Why don't you tell us how you came to be in pain? Was it something degenerative in nature, or were you in an accident? It was degenerative okay. um, in nature. It wasn't expected. Sure. At all. Okay. Um, when did you notice? Were you doing certain things when you noticed that onset of pain? Um, yes, it would be over time, like. Um, I didn't realize that I even had a problem. Um, After gardening or playing softball or um, walking for long periods of time, I would hurt in the lower part of my back or hurt in my hips, and I just thought that I was getting older um, at that time. Mm -hmm. You know what's amazing to me, Um, just sort of jumping off what Crystal's saying here, a lot of times through the process of aging, you know, mm-hmm. as we all get older, we experience more aches and pains and things like that. Yes. And we just, like she said, attribute it to aging. It reminds mm-hmm. me of, we've all heard about how if there's a pot of boiling water mm-hmm. and you put a frog in it and you turn the heat on, it'll sit there and not even know until all of a sudden the water's boiling. Have you guys ever heard of that? It's like a mm-hmm. science experiment. They don't, yeah. it happens so gradually. Where did you go to school? No. no. <laughs> the sadomasochist uh, <laughs> university no but it's it's yeah, it's it's a metaphor for when right. things happen super gradually you just don't notice it until right. all of a sudden you know boom everything compounds right yes and then pretty soon you can't ignore it and so how was it affecting your life day to day crystal it was um actually it all of a sudden it had been gradually but i was not aware of it okay. um what happened was is that i had studied all day long one after um one saturday sure. all day um laying across the bed or sitting at a at the table and the next morning on a saturday a sunday morning when i got up to get dressed when i put my feet on the floor 
my left leg would not hold me up any longer. It was excruciating pain. So that's how it started. Okay. uh, Just out of the blue. Okay. And what did you do? Um, Well, we, I had put it off for, you know, that day. It was extremely painful. Mm -hmm. And we went to the um, urgent care and urgent care has said that, it was probably um, some kind of arthritis that was setting up in the hip mm-hmm. or maybe a per, from a fall or from uh, childbirth, giving child, uh, during childbirth of my girls, okay. something you know, of that nature. It could have caused, been caused from that. Um, they gave me medicine and told me that, that I would need to see an orthopedic doctor. Got it. Um, and so then did you go as soon as you could to an orthopedist? I did. I saw okay. an orthopedic doctor. Um, the earliest I could get in was two weeks later. Um, wow. During that two weeks, I still was, I couldn't tie my tennis shoes. I couldn't dress myself. Right. I couldn't get in and out of the bathtub by myself. I was having to lay flat off my back. I could not sit up at all, and standing was very painful. How did After that make saw, you feel? Horrible. <laughs> I was um, yeah. horrible. That was five months ago. Mm-hmm. I was 37 years old and had two children, a 14-year-old and a 10-year-old, right. who Are is wide active. open. And all of a sudden, the mom who is carpooling and involved in everything of their life can do nothing anymore. I can't. I, I was completely helpless. Oh. And that's a horrible feeling when you are the caregiver and the go-getter. Um, I could no longer work. I yeah. was no longer. I, I didn't. I couldn't go to my job. I couldn't yeah. hold down the fort there. Um, I couldn't clean my home. Oh, I couldn't goodness. fix meals for my family. I could do absolutely nothing for myself. You know, Crystal. Hearing your story kind of reminds me. We've been talking about this la- a lot over the last few weeks. Yeah. You said you thought that it was from strenuous activity and aging, but as we're talking to you, I would never have asked you how old you were, because I just know that rule. You never ask a lady how old she is. Of course not. But I could tell you're a very young woman. Mm -hmm. And here in in your late, in your mid-30s, you're saying, oh, I'm getting old. And we kind of accept these conditions. Right. So what made you finally reach out to the Bonatti Spine Institute and see if they could help you? Well, after two months, I had seen... um, the orthopedic doctor and they had given me an injection in my hip and said that it was called it a bursitis or something like that sure. and that shot did not help and then I started having lower back problems um, that was even it was started going from my left hip all the way into the lower part of my back oh. so um, I had I was at my last resort I had seen him twice Mm -hmm. or three times. I had been to the ER like four times because of just unbearable pain. The pain would make me nauseated. Um, I would break out in sweats because of being in such great pain. Um, And no one could give me an answer of what was going on. So I actually went to see a chiropractor who was recommended to me Mm -hmm. because just let's see if he can, you know, relieve some of the pressure just to be able to have a little bit of normal right now because laying flat of your Mm -hmm. back is not doing it after almost two months. Right. And how did that work for you? Well, we went, I saw the chiropractor and all the chiropractor, I mean, he worked and it would relieve it for a moment and then while I was on the table, you could feel a difference. But then yeah. after I would get off the table, then that mm-hmm. it was gone. Um, right. I could barely walk out of the door, out Goodness. the door by myself some days. Um, so that was a really horrible feeling um, that no one could help me. I was to the point of no one being able to help me. And so what happened at that point? What brought you to the Bonatti Spine Institute? Um, Dr. Wynn, which okay. is the chiropractor that I had seen, had okay. told me that he had heard of a place and that several of his patients had seen, had been to the Bonatti Spine Institute, and that um, he would reckon, he thought that I needed to start looking at t- other options because of my age and that since nothing was seeming to work, 
and that he had had great reviews and the people that he had sent there had done really wonderful so that I needed to start doing my research. Okay, so obviously, just just for the sake of the radio show, you come into the Benati Spine Institute and take it from there. You, you had your evaluation um, with Dr. Benati. Why don't you explain that? My that was an incredible experience. Um, they had told us not told me not to tell him mm-hmm. what was wrong with me. Mm-hmm. That um, he would tell me what was wrong with me, and I was thinking, yeah, right. I mean, <laughs> no one has been able to tell me for two months what's wrong with me. But mm-hmm. okay, so he puts my MRIs up there, and he just starts mouthing off. Okay, you're hurting in your lower part of your back and your left hip. This is the feeling that you're feeling into your leg, and I, my mouth was. Uh, open because Mm -hmm. oh my goodness he's telling me exactly all the pains that I'm feeling at that moment Uh um and so what did he go ahead sir um he then looks at the thing at my MRIs and what was decided is that between L4 and L5 I had a bulging disc and between L5 and S1 that was their genitive that um there was some he called it messy. This is messy that needs to be cleaned up is okay. what was told to me at that time. <laughs> and so when you went into surgery, um, first off, did you watch the actual procedure? Because it's con- conscious IV sedation. Mm-hmm. You're able to communicate with the surgeon. And how how was that process itself? It was um, kind of scary at first, but um, sure. it was what was reassuring that my mom was able to go in the room with me. Mm-hmm. And um, I was... I watched the whole thing happen. Um, I watched the TV screen, and you would start realizing, okay, if he's getting close to this, you may feel a little, little something of discomfort. Mm -hmm. But that's gonna, it will relieve, and once it relieves, then you'll be out of pain in that that area. So that's what we started doing. He would talk to me, and you know, you you would tell him um, your hip was hurting, or your butt was hurting, or your leg was hurting. You Mm -hmm. wouldn't say "ow" because "ow" doesn't tell you where that pain is. Mm -hmm. So when I would, we would work together, and he would say, "Okay, this is how are you feeling now?" And Mm -hmm. and that's the process. (laughs) And when when did you notice a relief of your pain? Immediately. On the table right. during the preser- uh, procedure? It was after the procedure was over and it was time for me to get up and walk. When I put my feet on the ground, I knew at that time that there, the procedure had worked, that the pain that I had had in my hip was completely gone. Let me ask you, the things that you were unable to do when you were in such pain before you came to Benati, are you back at some of those activities? Yes, 100%. Um, <laughs> cleaning the yard, mm-hmm. uh, piss mowing, um, weed eating, playing <laughs> softball, playing badminton, all those things that I had not been able to do. And actually, I had been doing them for years. Right. And then they would put me down for several weeks afterwards yeah. because I just thought, you know, I'm getting older, as mm-hmm. we've said. Right. I'm able to do those things. And then when I wake uh-huh. up the next morning, there's no pain there, which is absolutely just wonderful. A great feeling that you can go and you know that the next day you're not going to pay for what you've done. Unbelievable. And based on your results, if you saw somebody suffering like you, would you feel free to tell them about the Benati Spine Institute? Of course. I've already uh, (laughs) recommended them to several people here in in, in Louisiana um, because I did. I got... Uh, a fix, uh, immediate results off of the fix. So yes, I would recommend them. Excellent. Well, continued good health. Crystal Morris of Pineville, Louisiana. Thank you for taking your time and sharing your story. Thanks for joining us, Crystal. Thank you. Continued good health. Have a good day. Yes, ma'am. Bye-bye. 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 I never tire Love of those, those stories. stories. Love it. Mm-hmm. If you are suffering like that and being told nothing can be done for you, I have something to say. They can. Benati succeeds where others fail. Make sure you check out Benati.com or 855-267-0483. Stay tuned. We'll have more after the break. Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Benati created, perfected, and patented the Benati Spine Procedures. 
Using his genius, Bonatti invented precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Bonatti Spine Procedures, they consistently reflect over 94% patient satisfaction. 45,000 successful procedures have been performed exclusively at our location. Nearly half our patients suffer from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. This is the first time that I am pain-free after 18 years. And it's just wonderful. I love it. Phenomenal results. No pain whatsoever. My pain is virtually gone. Nothing short of a miracle. Those surgeries gave me my life back. Already, I feel like a new person. I'm going home new. I can chase my grandbaby now. I can garden. I can cook. And uh, I'm really thrilled. The outcome has been remarkable. I feel 100% better. It's like a miracle. It was phenomenal. It literally did change my life. I was in a wheelchair at that time and uh, I left here walking. Every single pain that I had when I came here is gone. I'm ready to go home and feel great. This place is great. Thank you. Everything that they said they would do, they have done and I'm very, very satisfied and happy with those results. I knew in surgery, in fact I told the surgeon when he relieved the pain off the nerve. The pain is gone. I'm feeling wonderful. I have no pain. I feel better than I felt in four years from the surgery. It was almost immediate relief. Today I am totally pain free, which is just amazing. It's fantastic. It definitely works. I mean, I really don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Bonatti created, perfected, and patented the Bonatti Spine Procedures. Using his genius, Bonatti invented precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Bonatti Spine Procedures, they consistently reflect over 94% patient satisfaction. 45,000 successful procedures have been performed exclusively at our location. Nearly half our patients suffer from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. Welcome to American Medicine Today, presented by the Bonatti Spine Institute, featuring the internationally acclaimed inventor of the Bonatti Spine Procedures, Alfred Bonatti, MD. Now here along with Dr. Bonatti, your host, Kimberly Brumell. Well, thank you for joining us for American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Brumell, joined by our American Medicine Today radio executive producer, Ethan Euchre. Here as always, happy to be here. Yes. Well, we're excited because we have Dr. Dustin Duncan, assistant professor in the department of population health at NYU Langone. And he's also the lead author of a new study which discusses something called the Goldilocks syndrome, where parents often think their obese children are just the right weight. Mm -hmm. uh, and that continues to contribute to the obesity de epidemic. And he's here to talk about it. So thanks for being here, Dr. Duncan. Thank you, glad to be here. So if you wanna start out, just explain the study. And uh, I guess it studied two groups of children during mm -hmm. two different time periods, correct? Yeah, that's correct. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to examine the change um, over time in parents' perception of their, their preschool child's overweight. And so what we did is we used national data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, and what we did is we studied two particular groups of children at two time periods. So over 3,000 kids between 1988 to 1994, and then about 20 years later, another 3,000 set of kids um, between 2007 and 2012. Okay. And we examine if the if the parents um, misperceive their child's weight because we basically ask these parents of these children age two to five if they consider their children to be overweight, underweight, or just about the right weight. Mm -hmm. And we objectively measured the kid's height and weight, so we knew their body mass index, which is how we determine whether a child is overweight and ob or obese. Mm -hmm. And clearly, since you came up with the term the Goldilocks syndrome, uh, most parents thought their child was just just, right. just the right weight. Correct. Exactly. So what we found more particularly is that approximately 95% of parents identified their overweight child as about the right weight. And as high as 78% of parents perceive their obese child as just about the right weight, mm -hmm. which is very concerning. Yeah. Why do you think that is? 
So there's a number of reasons that we've posited, um, but the and which is based on uh, the evidence. And so one strong reason is this idea of social comparisons. And so you can imagine if you're a parent that you take your child um, to the preschool, you take your child to uh, neighborhood parks where they play. And if you see a lot of obesity around you, you may then think that your child is, uh, is normal weight, uh, given that there's a lot of obesity around you. And so the, the idea is that we're judging ourselves based on our social context or what we see every day as opposed to our clinical standards. And that's one predominant reason we think that might be going on here. Okay. See, this is something that has always fascinated me because I have more than a couple of sets of friends, but one mm-hmm. in particular where they had a child about five years ago mm-hmm. and both parents are overweight, okay? Mm-hmm. Um, they had the child and obviously the child wasn't born overweight. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he was just a normal sized child and now he's five years old and, and just he progressively got chubbier and chubbier and now he's this chunky little five year old. And I just, you know, as an observer think, and I, I see him very rarely too. So, you know, every now and then I see him and he's bigger and I just think, how do they not realize that their kid is getting fat and it's so unhealthy? Well, is he one of these children that just sits around and, you know, Plays forgive me games. if I use this, but yeah, they're just <laughs> playing games and they sit around. I, I remember when I was younger, outside. you were either in school or outside until the moon was out and the street lights came on and then you came home. But you were up and running around all day. Yeah. How much of that is a factor, Dr. Duncan? So, yes, we know that overweight and obesity is determined by uh, imbalance in energy expenditure. So your your energy intake exceeds your energy expenditure. So certainly there's evidence suggesting that not being physically active and um, being sedentary, i.e., for example, playing video games, especially video games that do not engage you uh, or encourage physical activity, is associated with overweight and obesity. And I would say that a number of things, the story that you've shared just now, are concerning. Um, so we know that these young kids who are overweight overweight and obese tend to be older kids who are overweight and obese. Then they tend to uh, be overweight and obese uh, adolescents and then overweight and then or obese uh, adults. And right. essentially, so it's a nasty the, cycle. It, the Obesity has yeah. followed its trajectory throughout your life course. Mm-hmm. And so it concerns me that your um, friend's child is overweight at five years old because essentially that child was, is more likely to be overweight and obese. Mm-hmm. And so I would say the following three things um, that the parents should do. One, I think that they should proactively discuss the weight issues, um, theirs as well as their child with their doctor. Um, and I think it's really important to remember that kids look up to their parents in, as role models in a number of domains, but including about their weight. And so I would really... M- attend to the parents' weight as well. And I would really focus on this idea of healthy living instead of weight control. Um, I'm really worried about kids, especially younger kids, um, feeling stigmatized and having other kind of negative health consequences Mm -hmm. that come with increased obesity if if you're focusing on the the weight um, exclusively all the time. You know, for example, uh, depression. Um, So I'll focus on really living healthfully, uh, which to me is uh, eating more, uh, excuse me, excuse me, not eating more, excuse me, eating healthfully and keeping active. Well, let me ask you something. Do you think some of this is contributed to the fact that nowadays people are on the go so much that you don't really have dinners at the table anymore and everyone just kind of takes their food? and Grab takes and bags of chips and they seat them, sell, sit themselves rather in front of the TV for hours? Yes, I think in, independently TV viewing is associated with um, increased obesity and we think mm-hmm. that there are two kind of mechanisms for that or, right. or put differently two reasons for that. Mm-hmm. One reason is that you're actively being sedentary um, and another reason is that you see a lot of marketing and food marketing, especially mm-hmm. foods that are energy dense um, yes. that don't really um, that you don't really need and foods that are high calories and you tend to eat those foods because you see them uh, marketed. And so that could be one thing. And I would certainly say our lifestyle has changed, you know, over the last um, certain, uh, over the last decades where we aren't helpful anymore. So for example, we tend not to walk um, to the degree that we, we used to, and we tend to eat out a lot more as opposed to having family meals. And we know that fast food is, has a lot of, uh, Mm-hmm. Un- 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 unnecessary calories. That's garbage. Um, and they tend not to be healthy healthy food in the first place. Dr. Duncan, here's another thing that's sort of a pet peeve of mine, and I want to get your thoughts on it real quickly as we come up on about a minute left. Mm-hmm. Um, I tend to think some of this has to do with the fact that 
in this country, in this day and age, we've become so politically correct that even the term overweight, you know, you're, if you say someone's overweight, you're fat shaming them, right. you know, and then there's also the, it's the culture of acceptance here in America where, mm-hmm. you know, uh, parents just, they, uh, th- there's no losers anymore. You get partici- uh, participation trophies just for showing up. So little Johnny can never do any wrong. How much of uh, that do you think uh, uh, parlays into this problem? So I, I would say that, that, my perspective is that social comparisons are, is probably the predominant reason for what's going on here. But your point is well taken. There is a stigma associated with being overweight and obese, and people there is um, uh, a lot of this sense of of, of being politically correct around terms, mm-hmm. um, which I think some of it is actually necessary um, to avoid stigmatization. But that could be part of it. And you can also imagine the case that you're a parent and your child is overweight and or obese. And you feel ashamed of that. And so you don't want to admit it to yourself. That also can be going on here. So I think there's a number of reasons, but I think that what you just suggested is certainly plausible. All right. I just remember when people would look at you and say, hey, it looks like you're gaining a little bit of weight. And instead of being offended, you were thinking, gee, they're Maybe thinking should... about your health, yeah. your overall health and wellness. Good looking out. Thank you. You know, and I need to do something about yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, but I would, I would say the difference, though, here is that these are really young kids. Okay. And so... The, the the parents like these are kids who are two to five. Mm-hmm. The parents may not be understanding also what overweight and obesity mean for the kid for that child, right. um, and they frankly could think that the child would grow out of it, um, which is not necessarily the case. And in fact, the child probably won't. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, like you said, they learn by what the parent puts in front of them and by what they see the parent do. So kind of mm-hmm. the whole monkey see, monkey do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, Dr. D- Dustin Duncan, where can people find this this study that you all have done on the Goldilocks syndrome? Yeah, so the study is um, published in Childhood Obesity. Um, so if you can look at online on Childhood Obesity um, for the study. All right. All right. Thank you very much for taking the time to be on our program. Um, Dr. Dustin Duncan, Assistant Professor in the Department of Population Health at NYU Langone. Thank Thanks you, for sir. joining us. Thank you again. Have a great day. Take care. All right. Well, you're listening to American Medicine Today. If you or someone you know is suffering with neck, back, or sciatic pain, they can reach out to the Benati Spine Institute, 855-267-0482, or visit Benati.com. Coming up after the break, you'll hear more. Make sure you stay tuned. Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Benati created, perfected, and patented the Benati Spine Procedures. Using his genius, Benati invented precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Benati Spine Procedures, they consistently reflect over 94% patient satisfaction. 45,000 successful procedures have been performed exclusively at our location. Nearly half our patients suffer from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Benati succeeds where others fail. This is the first time that I am pain-free after 18 years, and it's just wonderful. I love it. Phenomenal results. No pain whatsoever. My pain is virtually gone. Nothing short of a miracle. Those surgeries gave me my life back. Already, I feel like a new person. I'm going home new. I can chase my grandbaby now. I can garden. I can cook, and uh, I'm really thrilled. The outcome has been remarkable. I feel 100% better. It's like a miracle. It was phenomenal. It literally did change my life. I was in a wheelchair at that time and uh, I left here walking. Every single pain that I had when I came here is gone. I'm ready to go home and feel great. This place is great. Thank you. Everything that they said they would do, they have done and I'm very, very satisfied and happy with those results. I knew in surgery, in fact, I told the surgeon when he relieved the pain off the nerve. The pain is gone. I am feeling wonderful. I have no pain. I feel better than I felt in four years from the surgery. It was almost immediate relief. Today I am totally pain free, which is just amazing. It's fantastic. It definitely works. I mean, I really don't know what else to tell you. (laughs) I'm happy.
Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Bonatti created, perfected, and patented the Bonatti Spine Procedures. Using his genius, Bonatti invented precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Bonatti Spine Procedures, they consistently reflect over 94% patient satisfaction. 45,000 successful procedures have been performed exclusively at our location. Nearly half our patients suffer from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Bonatti succeeds where others fail. You're listening to American Medicine Today, presented by the Bonatti Spine Institute, featuring the internationally acclaimed inventor of the Bonatti Spine Procedures, Alfred Bonatti, MD. Once again, here are Dr. Bonatti and your host, Kimberly Brumell. Well, thank you for listening to American Medicine Today. I'm Kimberly Brumell, joined by our radio executive producer, Ethan Euchre. I am here as always. <laughs> well, uh, we're excited because on the line we have Dr. Melissa Murray, a neuroscientist at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Now, she and her team of researchers have been able to pinpoint a possible protein culprit behind the Alzheimer's disease. And she's here to tell us about it. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Murray. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Now, Dr. Murray, I understand that uh, there's these things called amyloids that were sort of the status quo of the culprit that people thought, researchers and scientists thought, was behind the development of Alzheimer's. And it was like that for 25 years. Something you and your team discovered is kind of throwing that on its head. So if Mm -hmm. you could, go ahead and describe what amyloids are first, as well as your tau protein that you found. Okay, and so stepping back, um, tau has actually been known to be around since Aloise Alzheimer first described the um, first patient, Augusti. But because of really strong changes in our genetics called mutations, um, the emphasis was put on amyloid. And when we talk about amyloid and tau, what that means is there are abnormal proteins in the brains of Alzheimer's patients that associate with cognitive decline. And so specifically, if we have a brain cell, And we think of a brain cell as having a train track that drives our food, our information, the support for that brain cell to live. Um, Holding that train track in in place actually is tau. Hmm. Now, in the normal brain, we want tau there. But in an Alzheimer's brain, as it starts to change shape, the train derails and it can no longer supply food and information. And so that's occurring inside the brain cell and that forms tangles. But outside of the brain cell is where amyloid forms. And so the idea is that maybe there's an interruption in the communication between brain cells. And so what has really been kind of pushed to the side until maybe the last decade or so is um, a focus on tau research. And what our study tries to do is actually not so much say we should only focus on tau and we should ignore amyloid. It's actually to think of them together because it is with both amyloid and tau that we can even confirm Alzheimer's disease. Hmm. When you guys are coming up um, with ways to prevent Alzheimer's, is do you think there will be some sort of pill or a surgery? How, how are you going to get those two to work together so that you aren't um, getting a deterioration of of the brain or, or of memory? That, I mean, that's a great question, and that's probably one of the hardest aspects of Alzheimer's is it's not just one single change. There's lots of changes mm-hmm. that are occurring, lots of proteins that are, that are misfiring or miswiring. And so similar to when um, the whole range of ideas for HIV came around, mm-hmm. there was a cocktail therapy, and there may need to be a cocktail therapy in that we have multiple different aspects that are being attacked, a really exciting part of um, the the push towards therapy is gene therapy, where it sounds very science fiction, but um, they're actually going to be able to target genes that have changes in them that lead a protein to become misfolded or basically aggregate in a way that it leads to the deterioration of the brain. And so Um, Another really, I think, encouraging avenue is actually preventative medicine, like um, health styles. So if you have diabetes in your family, really make sure not to get diabetes. You know, really try to change your food habits. If you are very sedentary, get off the couch. Walk for Mm -hmm. 30 minutes a day. I mean, it's even been shown in mouse models to 
stave off cognitive decline. And so those types of preventative measures, I think, are going to really be a big focus. And you know what I found interesting, Dr. Murray, is that you folks up at uh, the Mayo Clinic analyzed like 1,300, the brains of 1,300 deceased uh, Alzheimer's patients. And uh, I have a couple questions here, and it's maybe the morbid part of me coming out, but how does the brain look in appearance different from an Alzheimer's patient versus an average person? And B, how can um, how much of that is lifestyle, you know? And do you know sort of the backgrounds of the brains that you're looking at and what their lifestyle was like and their uh, their genetics and things like that? I find that fascinating. Yeah, no, it's actually one of the really important parts about describing um, what has occurred to an individual. So we benefit greatly from patients and caregivers and study participants. Uh, who have donated their brains. So we have one of the larger brain banks at the Mayo Clinic here in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. And so we studied initially a little over 3,000, and of those 3,000 who had these Alzheimer's changes, you could say, about 1,400 were Alzheimer's disease cases. And so when we receive a brain, half of it gets frozen, half of it gets fixed, And when we're evaluating it, you can really actually see a difference just looking at the brain, not even under the microscope, Mm. because on a global level, you know, right behind your, think of like underneath your forehead and all the way back to the back of your head, that's the outer part of your brain called the cortex, and it Mm. shrinks because brain cells are dying. And so if I was to look at a normal patient, we have wrinkles in our brain, and in this case, wrinkles are really beneficial because it allows us to expand our surface area, and so we can pack in a lot more. And okay. so a normal person has very tight wrinkles, whereas the Alzheimer's brain, because of this atrophy, has these wide spaces, and so it becomes readily apparent. And the um, sort of million-dollar question is the real estate of the brain. Alzheimer's affects very specific locations of the brain, so it helps to give us a clue while we're trying to understand what this person may have had. And then I think your other question was related to lifestyle. Um, One of the biggest uh, appearances that you can actually talk about is our effect on our vessels. So if a person had a really fatty diet or um, basically had uncontrolled high cholesterol, in fact, when they come to autopsy, the vessels have yellowish gook, for lack of a better word, where you can actually see the cholesterol having built up in their vessels. And your vessel, you can imagine, is a circle, and these people have closed-off circles, where it's just maybe even a pinpoint, a pinprick where our blood's being flown. And you've heard of hypertension, this high blood pressure. Um, it can actually lead to literal hardening of the vessel. The vessel is very flexible, and so it can get almost crunchy and hardened. And so it, it, it is actually really apparent lifestyle factors when you look at a brain postmortem. Now, I don't know if you've watched the TV recently, but there has been an influx of people running to, like, say, Walgreens or CVS trying to get something called Prevagen. And Prevagen is something that's new to the market and supposed to help increase brain capacity and memory. Um, What do you think about that? Is that something that may help ward off Alzheimer's? I actually have not heard of Prevagen. You haven't? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I know it's so bad. We get so focused that, like, I could tell you the latest cutting-edge research, but then... sure. Regular things, literally my mom's like, did you see on Newsweek? And I'm like, oh. no, no, I did not. <laughs> so you guys are helping keeping me normal. Thank you. <laughs> so I actually had not heard of it. And okay. um, I'm looking at it now. It's talking about dietary supplements. And it mm-hmm. is something, not necessarily Prevagen, but in general there are um, industry-led um, effects where they're trying to look at dietary supplements. And kind of goes back to what your doctor would tell you if, if you were to go to him or her, you know, have a healthy lifestyle. Like when they talk about taking dietary supplements, you know, people need to step back and actually just think about the food they're eating. Mm-hmm. Have a colorful plate. You know, a lot of these dietary supplements you could just get from your food, but we, you know, live in such a busy world that we forget to. And so I can't really comment too much. I mean, my hope is, of course, if it can improve memory, that'd be fantastic. But I don't know the science behind it, honestly. 
And Dr. Murray, sort of in closing, um, where is the state of your research with these tau proteins, mm -hmm. and what are the implications, and uh, like, what's the time frame of what the future holds for your research? One of the really exciting parts that um, my research has moved toward is tau imaging. So we've had the capability of imaging amyloids so that we could see inside a person's brain while they were alive to understand perhaps where they're at in the disease course. Wow. And so I'm working with uh, my collaborators up at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester and other groups where we now may have the ability to see inside a person's brain and see how the tau is accumulating. And one of the reasons this is important is as we test healthy lifestyles or as we test new therapies that come out, we want to know, is that tau stopping? Maybe is it going away? You know, even just to slow down the disease by a few years, it would be a miracle, you know, just to have had my grandma for three more years. And so that it's, it's moving more toward the preventative aspects of Alzheimer's research, specifically focused on tau imaging. Well, thank you for giving us an update on where things stand with the Alzheimer's um, disease. Uh, this is Dr. Melissa Murray, a neuroscientist at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. Please keep us updated if you should come across anything Any new. Any new developments, yeah. yeah. I will. I have really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you guys for having me today. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Murray. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Good stuff. Absolutely. Right. You learn a lot of new things here on American Medicine Today. Coming up after the break, well, you'll just hear more, so stay tuned. Um, if you or someone you know suffering with neck, back, or sciatic pain, they can reach out to the Benati Spine Institute, 855-267-0482, or visit Benati.com. Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Benati created, perfected, and patented the Benati Spine Procedures. Using his genius, Benati invented precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Benati Spine Procedures, they consistently reflect over 94% patient satisfaction. 45,000 successful procedures have been performed exclusively at our location. Nearly half our patients suffer from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Benati succeeds where others fail. This is the first time that I am pain free after 18 years. And it's just wonderful. I love it. Phenomenal results. No pain whatsoever. My pain is virtually gone. Nothing short of a miracle. Those surgeries gave me my life back. Already I feel like a new person. I'm going home new. I can chase my grandbaby now. I can garden, I can cook, and uh, I'm really thrilled. The outcome has been remarkable. I feel 100% better. It's like a miracle. It was phenomenal. It literally did change my life. I was in a wheelchair at that time and uh, I left here walking. Every single pain that I had when I came here is gone. I'm ready to go home and feel great. This place is great. Thank you. Everything that they said they would do, they have done and I'm very, very satisfied and happy with those results. I knew in surgery, in fact I told the surgeon when he relieved the pain off the nerve. The pain is gone, I'm feeling wonderful. I have no pain, I feel better than I felt in four years from the surgery, it was almost immediate relief. Today I am totally pain free, which is just amazing, it's fantastic. It definitely works, I mean I really don't know what else to tell you, <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Benati created, perfected, and patented the Benati Spine Procedures. Using his genius, Benati invented precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Benati Spine Procedures, they consistently reflect over 94% patient satisfaction. 45,000 successful procedures have been performed exclusively at our location. Nearly half our patients suffer from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Benati succeeds where others fail. 
You're listening to American Medicine Today, presented by the Bonatti Spine Institute, featuring the internationally acclaimed inventor of the Bonatti Spine Procedures, Alfred Bonatti, MD. Once again, here are Dr. Bonatti and your host, Kimberly Brumell. You are listening to American Medicine Today. I am Kimberly <laughs> Brumell, joined by our friend and executive radio producer, Ethan Euchre. I like how you say that with authority. <laughs> you are listening, you are. and you better keep listening. <laughs> and they will. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and then we have our senior fellow, Jeff Wagstaff. Don't touch that dial. (laughs) And across from me, world-renowned orthopedic surgeon, Dr. Alfred Benatti, who's all wound up and ready to talk about this upcoming segment. Let's look at what's new in medicine today, featuring Alfred Benatti, MD. (laughs) Well, there's a write-up based on Johns Hopkins University's um, look about Obamacare, and they're talking about how it's highly inefficient. Go figure. Well... We know it's inefficient. All the things yeah. that Obama did is are inefficient. So correct. So we need to correct with the next uh, president. The only problem is going to take us 20 years to arrange all the mess that he's going to leave. Mm-hmm. Somebody's they, got a lot of work to do. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, absolutely. Well, I hope it's Trump. Trump, Trump will get to it the second he's in. <laughs> because he can correct the problems of this miserable... Dr. Minotti has a way to work Trump into every, every conversation, conversation we have. Hey, Doc, so how's that steak over here? Well, I don't know, but it's I bet a, Trump would like it. It's a Trump steak. <laughs> he no, may not like it. <laughs> or maybe he, he won't he, like he, it. He, he may want a better steak than the one that we're eating now. <laughs> he will call that steak names and say yeah, it's ugly. Yeah, that's no. it. <laughs> what I feel like we're well, doing the Godfather uh, let's here. Let's get serious uh, here. Okay, Doc. Uh, John Hopkins uh, just started to do some comments about the, the enthusiasm of the healthcare government uh, uh, on Obamacare. Mm-hmm. This is amazing. And, you know, I'm going to be ugly here. I'm so happy that the people that they elect uh, Obama is the ones that are suffering more of all these Obama uh, uh, laws and, and enthusiasm for uh, health care that is not payable by anybody huh. or mm-hmm. any type of a... That is very ugly. A, <laughs> that's that is very, so that's ugly. a little dark. But <laughs> it's not but ugly. You know so it's not really, ugly, but it's the I, truth. I understand. I understand. People should have really paid attention and not just elect officials because hey they think they're cool or hey you know i'm a community organizer or i can play the saxophone or yeah but you know uh, i'm I'm gonna say something here that is really really a little bit out of of tone but you know something look you have somebody who has uh, 10 billion dollars and manage something with 10 billion dollars has a tremendous amount of knowledge about that mm-hmm. and then suddenly you look at the other candidates mm-hmm. on the on the on the on the yes. on the rostrum mm-hmm. hey, some people has a million dollars of of uh, wealth and some mm-hmm. other people has 2 million dollars of wealth mm-hmm. how are you going to compare the management of somebody who right. managed enterprise of ten billion dollars with somebody who barely in all his life is making a million dollars so it's common sense to see who we need to elect period now let's go back to what talking about the (laughs) jump back back to trump okay (laughs) in in jump hopkins they just came over that not only is affecting the the republicans Mm -hmm. and the democrats but the the, the republicans the the the, in the and the independents Mm -hmm. The, the the Republicans, 25% of the Republicans are, are against the program. Sure. And now, suddenly, when you start to see all these deductibles mm-hmm. and the people start to go to a doctor and cannot go to a doctor, sure. and you have an Obama type of a program and you go and mm-hmm. cost you $5,000 in, well, in deductible? Deductible is one thing. Out of pocket is a whole other oh, expense. Oh, yeah, but, that are two exp- but those are ones, we're not talking about late. those ones yes. because the doctor needs to collect that. But the deductible is for mm-hmm. the insurance companies. So right. what happens is the deductibles you need to pay or it's Correct. against the law. Mm-hmm. The, the, the out of pocket is something that maybe you can work it out with the doctor. Mm-hmm. All right? And the problem is here 25% right. of the, 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 the Republicans are were and are against the Obamacare. Right. Ahora, it's around 12% of the independents. Mm-hmm. It's around 12% against around 12% of the of the Democrats. Right. So we start to see now, not only the Democrats are, are upset with this situation, the independents are also upset with this situation. Mm-hmm. And the Republicans are saying for a long time, hey, this is not going to work. <laughs> now, the problem with the Obama Obamacare in all this situation, mm-hmm. in the report that they are, are the mandate that drive seniors to 
take pills. So what's happening with you today is is 116 million Americans that they are in pain in the nation. Mm -hmm. Look at that number. 116 million Americans have Mm -hmm. some sort of the pain and some chronic pain. Right, but that's because medicine can keep you medicated and reduce your pain, but it still never fixes the problem. Well, the the problem is exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Uh, The American medicine is great because you have a specialist that they have really how to target the problems and correct the problem. Right. But you've also drawn the parallel that with Obamacare, they are trying to get rid of specialists like you and other specialists because they want to have health care providers, medical providers, nurse practitioners giving um, medications and doing health care and trying to reduce the level that uh, doctors used to be held at when they were specialists. Well, they you had, had your they primary had, care and then you had specialists up here. Yeah, well, the, the, the primary care also is in a lot of trouble mm-hmm. now. They thought that was jumping with the Obamacare that would be fantastic for mm-hmm. them. Well, you know, guess what? They increase the amount of, of services that they have. They are seeing patients like crazy, right. and they're making one-third of the money that were hurting before. Right. So they are, they are practically giving this patient care to nurse practitioners mm-hmm. because they don't have time. And when you go to the pharmacy, the pharmacist now is prescribing medications. Mm-hmm. So you have a pharmacist who is a doctor, and you have a practitioner who is neglecting okay. his patients and giving the thing to the nurses. Right, but with the pharmacist, how scary that is, Ethan, because mm-hmm. sometimes there are filling prescriptions that contradict and can cause bad reactions together, and right. they they don't even use their brains to see that you might have a problem, and they hand them both to you at the same time. How scary is because that? Because they don't have responsibility on that. That's the responsibility of the mm. physician. And, well, when, and, when, and when that thing happens, then you go to a doctor and say, why do you prescribe this? Well, I didn't prescribe this. A pharmacist right. did. Oh, you're supposed to know that. You're supposed to <laughs> check the medication. I understand. Well, this is the chaos that great Obama brought to the nation. Right. And that's a look <laughs> at what's new in medicine today with Alfred Benatti, MD. The study that he's talking about came out September 21st of this year, just to let you know. Anyway, that wraps up quite an eventful American medicine today. If you or someone you know suffering with neck, back, or sciatic pain, reach out to Benatti at Benatti.com, 855-267-0483. Make sure you tune us in on WFTS, ABC, or check out Bloomberg Saturdays and Sundays and tweet at Dr. Venati or hashtag that American was a Medicine Today. Pathetic whistle right there. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> I couldn't give you any. Revolutionary in his field, Dr. Benatti created, perfected, and patented the Benatti Spine Procedures. Using his genius, Benatti invented precise tools necessary to minimize surgery, scarring, anesthesia, and recovery. So successful are the Benatti Spine Procedures, they consistently reflect over 94% patient satisfaction. 45,000 successful procedures have been performed exclusively at our location. Nearly half our patients suffer from failed back and neck surgeries at other facilities. Benatti succeeds where others fail. This is the first time that I am pain free after 18 years. And it's just wonderful. I love it. Phenomenal results, no pain whatsoever. My pain is virtually gone, nothing short of a miracle. Those surgeries gave me my life back. Already I feel like a new person. I'm going home new. I can chase my grandbaby now, I can garden, I can cook, and uh, I'm really thrilled. The outcome has been remarkable. I feel 100% better. It's like a miracle. It was phenomenal. It literally did change my life. I was in a wheelchair at that time and uh, I left here walking. Every single pain that I had when I came here is gone. I'm ready to go home and feel great. This place is great. Thank you. Everything that they said they would do, they have done and I'm very, very satisfied and happy with those results. I knew in surgery, in fact I told the surgeon when he relieved the pain off the nerve. The pain is gone, I'm feeling wonderful. I have no pain, I feel better than I felt in four years from the surgery, it was almost immediate relief. Today I am totally pain free, which is just amazing, it's fantastic. It definitely works, I mean 
really don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs>